the cloud and how they see the future, I said to them, well, this is really, really in line with what IFAC wants our members to, to, to know and to do. Um, in particular, if you've studied IFAX, which I now believe is outdated, um, a manual for small and uh, medium enterprises. I don't know whether you've seen that, but one of the components in practice management is the, the firm and, and its IT and software um, module. So today we're going to listen to uh, the fourth industrial revolution. I did uh, a little bit of research on this revolution um, to just because this was a new term to me, just to see where this is coming from. So we 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 in for a for an, for a, an eye-opening presentation, and um, and also to look at the impact of that on your firm. So and I think what we said is that at least we will walk away here today with some strategy or plan for your own IT strategy. The presentation will be made available as well yes, as a, a recording of it, as well as a recording of it, so that you can. Mm -hmm if your partners haven't attended it. I know it's very difficult if you're on your own and you have a partnership. Now to con convince the partner and sell what you hear to, to the partner is a totally different story. So that is really, really good to happen. So over okay. to you. Thank you very much, Carl. My name is Ferdi van Skalkak. I head up the technology division of IPMG. So basically around IT strategy and um, managing the implementation team, mating client requirements to technological or non-technological solutions. So that's what, uh, what I primarily handle. So the discussion today is around, you know, what is the fourth industrial revolution? And what does it mean for audit and accounting practices and also by extension your clients as well? Okay. So why we're here today is to identify the challenges and opportunities that the fourth industrial revolution brings, and then also to introduce and discuss uh, business enabling technologies that will assist us going forward in addressing those challenges and opportunities. So the format for the discussion tonight uh, is number one, just doing it quickly, we've done the introductions now, and to look at the impact uh, with regards to the challenges and opportunities, and then also talking about a strategy for how to, uh, how to respond to these challenges, which we've laid out as our, as our house view of what organizations should be looking at now and in, in uh, on the horizon in terms of uh, what they need to do to prepare. And then in the end, we'll have a sufficient time for questions, comments, or any discussions. We've brought along our experience in the room, so if there is a question that you have, we've likely encountered it before, and I'm sure somebody will be able to add value to, to, to that answer or for your question. Okay, so introductions, we've introduced the team. Ultimately, what IPMG does is we focus on making sure that your technology is serving your business requirements. That's ultimately what it's about. It's not about supplying computers and supporting them. It's about looking at, are you procuring the right systems? Are your business processes modernized along with the technology that you're using? <coughs> ultimately, to look at empowering you to make an informed decision in and around technology and the related spaces of information governance. So our approach is a little bit different from most te uh, technology firms because uh, we very quickly uh, identified that there's a problem in the technology industry and that they focus too much on the technology side of things. We call it technology for technology's sake. You know, where decision making is of often driven by that technology, we buy the features, we don't buy the solution that those features offer. And that's, uh, and that's diluted the original purpose of technology. What the emphasis needs to be is technology is there to handle information more efficiently and effectively. That's why it was originally developed and what we should be looking, uh, looking to it for. And business information should be central to INT governance. You know, that's, that's the key, key uh, mantra behind our, behind, behind our advice. And you will actually see that um, frameworks like governance frameworks like King 4 are introducing the term information and technology. They don't call it information technology anymore. They're two separate things uh, with separate considerations. And we very much support that viewpoint as well. So where do we, where do we look at, where do we assist in organizations? How do we go about thinking about technology? Well, we start right at the top with the owners and stakeholders. 
all the way through governing bodies, executive management, down to operations as well. Because you need to have that end-to-end -end approach, otherwise things don't align and you don't meet your strategic objectives. So first off, IT governance policy. How do we make technology decisions? IT strategy. How do, what, how do we set our goals and how do we reach those, go those goals through strategy? And then we assist with implementation plans, modernizing or systemizing of business processes. Looking specifically at our focus at the moment is around automation and integration for agility. We don't really know exactly what the future holds, so we need to prepare to be agile and be quick to adjust. And of course, business intelligence, which is very quickly gaining some steam um, with real world applications. <clears throat> Ultimately, the end-to-end -end approach circles back to what is the purpose of the governance? It's value delivery. How do we optimize risks? How do we optimize resources? And how do we make sure that we, that the, we realize our benefits? Ultimately, for profitability. Okay, so that's just a little bit of, about how we think um, at, at, about technology as a, as a firm. And just introducing what is this fourth industrial revolution. So we tend to align ourselves with the World Economic Forum definition for what is the fourth industrial revolution. So the first ones was water and steam, then electricity, electronics and IT, and we are pretty much at the end of the third industrial revolution and we have been taking our first steps into the fourth one where innovation, economic change, and social change is been, is, will be brought about by rapid technological development and converging of technologies. So some industries are very early in that curve. Uber is a very good example of that, where technology was able to dis disrupt a very old and established business model, and now that industry is having to uh, play catch up with new players innovating in that space. So the World Economic Forum has got detailed documentation on what the impact of the fourth industrial revolution is likely to mean, but we're highlighting a few key changes that we see are pertinent to, to everyday business. And that's the disruption in jobs and skills, security and conflict issues. We've all seen the trade wars that are going on and how technology companies are starting to become part of that trade war. And so that's something we need to keep in our mind when we make selections for technology. Productivity and empowerment and new opportunities in innovation is also, is also be going to be part of that. Then we're looking at the so social changes and also the governance changes where governance requirements are, requirements are increasing complexity and we need to be able to adjust to those on a, a fairly dynamic manner. So let's look at the challenges for SMEs. Adapting your technology to, supp uh, to support agile and efficient processes. So dealing with the overwhelming and rapid influx of technologies and software, you know, every day you get an email with another software you have to have or you, you need or is going to revolutionize your business. And being able to cut through all that noise to get to the essence of what the really important message is, is going to be a, a challenge. What we're also seeing is that the local and smaller software providers are being challenged by the really big and established very high, large scale organizations. So the software that you have managing your practices or doing the accounting with, the ones that are coming from smaller software firms are under threat by the very big firms with the budgets and capacity to innovate at a scale that the smaller form, the firms simply cannot. And then also looking at the skill set and capacity required for timeliness and informed decision making is something that is also exceedingly rare and that's part of what, what uh, we do is in empowering you with the knowledge in order to make that dis those decisions. So that's first of uh, the first challenge. The second one is achieving sustainability in a technology enhanced business. So 
In an environment where IT costs are set to increase more and more, of course, the business needs to adjust accordingly and make sure that the, you're getting the value for that, uh, for that technology. So that doesn't necessarily just mean you need to migrate to the cloud. It means you also need to adjust your business model and your business processes to make best use of that new technology. If you use the old technology the sa or the new technology the same way as the old one, you're not going to see the benefits of it. And then leveraging technology for business intelligence um, to ensure that you have accurate and timeliest information for decision making. Then the third challenge is meeting the expectations of change with an increasingly technology competent clientele and workforce. So what you're finding is that the younger generation are shorter attention spans, higher demands in terms of turnaround time, they want it their way and they want it now. And that's something that's going to become increasingly common as the younger generation becomes the, 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 the majority of the client base. Also the levels of self-service of the expectation. Why do I have to do this with a person? Can't I do this online? Those sort of expectations. It's also opportunities in this revolution. Automation and systemization is, is one very, very big thing. Now that doesn't mean the system is going to do everything. We don't, uh, we don't believe that. We believe that the first phase of this, this uh, revolution is going to be something we call augmented human productivity. The human is not going to be cut out, but the human is going to be empowered with technology to do more. And at quite significant scale in some, in some cases. And then smart devices and increased connectivity is going to enable a more efficient flow of work. A simple example is when I put petrol in the, co in the company car, I don't have to give the slip to anybody. App on the phone, take a picture, add a note, save. The admin has been done. It's already reconciled in the bank, uh, with the bank account uh, entry an hour later. That's the sort of mechanisms that we see will become increasingly common in all our client interactions. So an example of that, uh, taking bookkeeping, you know, the, the most menial of, the, of work that, that is being done in our firms. If you look at the job, is invoice and receipt capturing. And let's say there's 500 documents that need to be captured. They need to be collected from the client. They need to be captured. You need to query any information that's missing from them. You need to allocate them and you need to reconcile them. So a human being on their own with traditional older technology can do maybe 500 of those documents within a week at 33 productive hours in a, in a, in a week of their 40 hour day. So that's about four minutes average per document, uh, per document that they need to spend. On some documents they spend more, on others they spend less. But the key thing is we want to bring that average down. Now if we take a human and we amplify that, per, that human's uh, uh, ability with technology, we, we have it that the automation rules will handle the collection, capturing, possibly even the querying, the allocating and the reconciling so that they only have to review the exceptions. So we cut down the average time they spend on a document to one minute. So if the technology has saved this individual 20 and the firm 29 hours per week, that's, that's, almost, a, that's almost a full, per, a full employee. And that's, those are the sort of augmented benefits that we, that we refer to. There's additional benefits to this automation. The information is available immediately. I spoke from petrol being uh, put in the car to it being reconciled against the bank account taking about an hour on a, on a, on a practical case. Maybe 24 hours depending on how your, your workforce is structured. There's fewer <coughs> mistakes as well. You know, the technology for the most part will exceed the accuracy of the average human being. Very important, human oversight is retained. That is still essential. When you're automating something with technology, you're also automating mistakes. So you do need human oversight that can apply their creative mind to spot the differences. Humans are very good at, at picking up exceptions to patterns. I spoke about the automated bank reconciliation. And then the value that that adds to the client. 
because if you make your life easier, by extension, you're going to make your client's life easier as well, and you're going to have a happier client. So if you can save your client time, give them immediacy and transparency as to the process, you're going to have a much happier client, especially with the younger generations. The second opportunity is using the advanced functionality that is currently brought, being brought in by the globalization that we are seeing in the technology industry, where very large, the very large providers, the Googles and the Microsofts of the world, are providing fantastic functionality that they are only able to provide because they've got the scale that they have. And then the advanced and cost-effective business intelligence tools are becoming much more accessible. For the, for the average business. Uh, Marinda at our office is currently re-engineering a financial services business's compliance structures by saying a compliance officer in financial services is traditionally a grudge purchase. The law says I have to have it. And now it's a case of we are building a business intelligence system based on the work that is already being done in compliance, the sampling that is being done. That sampling is valuable information that the compliance officer can step into a new role as an advisor to that business because they've got, they're leveraging the information that they're collecting with technology. So those are the sort of innovative ideas that um, businesses need to think about is your information is an asset. What you have and what you do with it uh, impacts your business and gives you op additional opportunities. So talking about the new um, specific opportunities is the ability to integrate accounting systems into business intelligence systems. You, know, and you can provide business intelligence information to your, uh, to your clients as well. The other thing is to tie your business intelligence systems into your client systems. If you have clients in inventory and manufacturing and doing production management and they're importing and exporting and you need to manage that the taxation is happening correctly at the correct stages, tie directly into their system so you can help them manage that process for them. Yeah, so we spoke about the, the, the client integration and then Augment the knowledge and expertise provided by supporting your clients and adopting these same strategies. Be part of the solution with your, with your clients. Uh, don't, uh, don't be in a position where you're caught out and having to play catch up with the demands of your clients that are more technologically advanced than you are. Okay. So let's talk about the IPMG approach to these challenges and opportunities. How do we go about you know, a technology enhanced business in this fourth industrial revolution? So the first thing that we do is we assess what is your information management maturity in your organization. Where are you operationally? Where are you in terms of the business intelligence capacity? And where are you in terms of, we sort of lump them together as artificial intelligences, but it's more a case of what unknown future innovations may come to the fore that we may need to be prepared for. So on the operational level, we all started at level zero with paper. Paper processes, a file travels from one desk to the, the other. We then went to unintegrated systems where there's human transposing and human data capturing happening. So that it's more or less similar to the original paper file, it's just moving electronically now. Level two is where data is being synchronized between systems. If I add a client onto this one system, on, by tomorrow the client automatically appears on another system. So the majority of firms are already employing some form of, of, of data synchronization. But those are more to save people time and to cut down on errors rather than adding new business value necessarily. And then imports and exports. I pull a report from a system and then I dashboard it and to create quarterly or monthly reports for how the business is doing. And the third level, and where we, where we advise clients that they need to be moving towards, is what we call transactional integration. When something happens in one system, it triggers an action in another system. A quote is accepted, an invoice is emailed, and a client's debit order is loaded on the, on the debit order management system. Those are the sort of transactional integrations that we are, are referring to. In terms of business intelligence, right now most firms are on level one. They've got moment in time reporting. The data in that report is 90 to 30 days old. 
and it's typically compiled by a human, having to source the data from different sources and having to compile it. And level two is real-time uh, uh, real business intelligence, where the information is generally under 24 hours old and it is automatically generated. Nobody has to compile that information. It is available immediately to the business to make decisions and to adjust to tra changing trends. Okay. So talking a little bit about unknown future innovations, if we look at right now, there's a f at level zero, there's a few niche industries that are already utilizing information on, at a very large scale in, as a core of their business model. And that's online advertising and stock trading. How Google or Facebook determines which advert to show you is pr currently pushing most of the innovation within the, uh, within the artificial intelligence space because they've got massive amounts of information that they need to look for patterns in. And that is something that is common across all, bus all businesses. But in their one, it's core to their business model. And then the level one is when the real world future applications start showing up. Now, that level one is not really available to businesses at the moment. Now, the word that we are, that we are looking for, the term that we, we expect it to be called, is artificial intelligence as a service. And that is where there's a service online where you can plug data in, tell it what is important to you, and it will kick out results for you and pick out exceptions and patterns that, you, that may have value to your business. So currently there's a lot of people developing that. There's a lot of people purporting that they have that, but we've yet to see real concrete practical applications. But this is something that is probably within the two-year horizon or three-year horizon of being commonly available to a small practice, the same way you would rent your software or buy a, a, an online mailbox or web meeting software. That's the sort of level that we're, we're looking for. And ultimately what you're going to be using this for is what we call assisted decision making. There's some schools of thought that think that in, in terms of large Fortune 500 companies are expected to have an artificial intelligence as a member of the board or at least as a capacity advising the board uh, for in their decision making. So this is how we currently evaluate where an organization is currently and we assist them to migrate to the more mature levels of information uh, management. So how do we go about getting there? So if we look at response number one, is build the globalization and integration into your, uh, into your strategy. Switch over to software that can be easily integrated and are provided as software as a service. Replace your traditional technologies with, with more advanced versions and more, uh, advanced, uh, and more convenient mechanisms. Utilize the global public infrastructure, known as the cloud, um, for, um, rather than local and private infrastructures. Um, because most of the investment in integration of systems is happening between the different cloud providers. It is very, very tricky to get these, um, to get systems to talk if the environments are not predictable. So if you, if you, to be part of this future innovation space, you need to be where the innovation is happening. And then utilize agile and flexible technologies that can be easily adapted. Beware, beware of closed ecosystems going to one product provider <coughs> and saying they will give you software to do everything that your practice needs. That's a very dangerous thing because if you're, if you're backing the, 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 wrong, uh, the wrong company, then you might you find yourself you're painted into a corner and you're unable to innovate with the rest of the market. So talking about integration, because that's our f uh, the key uh, component of our, first, uh, of our first response. And that is, do not evaluate systems for what they can do. Evaluate systems for what they can do in the context of all your other systems and, and, and in your business. And, this, um, and cross vendor integration is essential, something we call universal integration. You know, if, the, if the, the software doesn't care if you're using Google, Microsoft, or Oracle, or whoever, if it integrates with multiple parties, then you've got flexibility and agility to adjust. 
Also favor systems that can integrate directly with your, cri uh, with your clients where transactions are, uh, transactions are automated. We see this a lot in small scale manufacturing where they do a business to business integration. I have a business, I manufacture signs. I've got my regular clients that order the same things from me and I keep manufacturing it for them. Why should they uh, have to phone me or email me to order the thing that they had made three weeks ago? They can go onto a web portal, they can see do I have stock available to manufacture what, I'm look what they're looking for and they can see before they order what the expected turnaround time of that would be. They would order it, the finance, uh, financial component is taken care of in the in the business to business system and they can have that level of integration with them. Some of the larger, uh, larger clients might actually automate their own internal procurement systems to kick off the external contractor uh, contracted work. So those are the sort of integrations that we anticipate would be part of your clients day to day uh, very soon, if not al uh, already for some of them. And then machine to machine communication, that's why I, uh, what I mentioned that the process does not involve a human being, it is automate, automatically running from a system to a system. And by the way, this is also going to be where we anticipate your industry is getting new sources of revenue from, where you can have new services that you provide your clients. If your accounting systems that you are providing and the financial statements that you are providing are tied into their production systems with the real numbers, you've got the information to provide them with a business intelligence and a financial management uh, um, service where you can advise them based on the financial management of, the, of their business and the performance thereof. And of course, being able to provide better advice for business improvement. This portion of your business is performing very well with very predictable income. This one is fluctuating a lot more. The clients are so busy with the day-to-day -day operations of their business, they need that independent advice and that independent oversight um, with regards to the financial management of their business. So I want to talk about cross-vendor integration, specifically using accounting software as one example. And uh, we picked the three biggest names in, in, in South Africa and we, we were asked by a client, evaluate these three options for us in terms of selecting one to have a track record for for the next five years. So we looked at Sage Online, Xero and QuickBooks as the, the three biggest ones. So what we saw is, where is Sage Online? Um, first thing is we address that Sage Online has no relation with Pastel. You know, a lot of people have got that misperception. Softline was purchased by Sage Online. The products are not, were not designed by the same people. And the Sage Online product that is currently being marketed was actually developed in the UK and then adapted for the South African market. And we actually see that Sage Online is currently lagging behind on integration partners. They've got about 50 integrations listed on their website as people that they can integrate with. But what we notice is many of those are their own products. So, and there's a lack of the large players in the market. There's no Google, there's no Microsoft, no Zoho, no Salesforce, those large global, global giants in, in software. And there's a lack of support for integration services, which I will touch in more detail on, on, a, on a subsequent slide. Now, if you compare that, uh, if you look at their market, uh, their market cap over the last four years, you can see it's been largely flat. The market is not all that ex uh, does not seem to be all that excited about what they're doing, uh, because it seems to be business as usual with them. Now, if we look at Zero and QuickBooks, they are the ones that have been driving the innovation over the last four to five years. You know, they, uh, in terms of, um, they had both had cloud accounting two years before Sage had a product to the market. QuickBooks tends to dominate North America. That's where they are the de facto standard within that market, where Xero seems to dominate the rest of the world with their original roots within Australia and New Zealand. Now, if you look at, they've got a significant number of integration partners. QuickBooks has got about 500 integration partners on their website and the big name players are on that list. And Xero, they've got about 1,500 integration partners, people that integrate their software with theirs. And they are supported by all the major integration services, which I'll cut, uh, get, get to into more detail shortly. 
Now, if you look at what the market is thinking about their businesses, you can see there's a distinct upward trend in both of those businesses. And that's the sort of, that's the information that we took back to our client to allow them to make an informed decision around which cloud accounting platform should they invest in. So we're not looking at, you know, does this thing have this feature? Does this thing have that feature? We are looking at the big picture, you know, the overall large decisions. Because it's not on the small things that will make things succeed or fail, it's on the large things. So we care about the large things. So talking about universal integration and the rise of the integration service. So what we've seen is that almost all modern applications have APIs. You go onto a product and say, and they say, we have an API, here it is, integrate with us. Does that mean your software can talk to their software? Probably not, when you start digging into it. So what has happened is everybody has an API, but people don't sit around the table and develop an API for each other. Something needs to facilitate that process in the middle. And that's what happened with uh, a lot of businesses that, uh, uh, that, that offer this third-party integration <coughs> service. So they provide a platform that it will fetch things from one system and input it into another system and convert the format on the way through. So, and, and, and that's essentially the market leader at the moment is Zapier, but the, there are dozens of these and they are valued in multiple billions of dollars where they did not exist two and three years ago. The, so this is something that came very quickly on the market because um, a lot of people is, uh, identified the gap in that market. And typically these services are priced per transaction along the lines of half a cent per task that it does. You know, something like $250 per month for 50,000 tasks. So now you're starting to compare the time that a system can push information or pull information from one system and push it into another versus a human being copying and pasting. And that's the sort of direct comparison that people are, are looking at and saying, ooh, we better upskill our staff to provide a new level of service into the future. So looking at one example, um, just on the, on the right hand side of how the system works, this is actually a screenshot from the system. It says, when a quote is accepted in this software package, create a sales invoice and send, up in, uh, send out a templatized email with that invoice attached. So even though the quoting software doesn't have the ability to generate an invoice, Zapier can facilitate that whole, that whole process. So now suddenly you're looking at not, I've got this system and I need to live within the restrictions of the this, of this system. I can look at all my systems and I can say I want some of that and some of this and you get the best of both worlds. So that's essentially what this, these integration services are offering. So Zapier, Integromat, Microsoft Flow, there's a lot of, there's a lot of them. And depending on which platforms you have and which uh, integration services are supported with them, you would then make a decision on which integration service you, will, uh, you can commit to. So this diagram is very busy. So before you go into the detail of this diagram, uh, what, what is this meant to illustrate is how does the big picture fit together in terms of the integrations? So traditionally we would have multiple uh, software products within our business. We'd have accounting software, we'd have software we do our line of business with crafting financial statements. We keep our time on a system, we do CRM and sales in another and these systems would typically live in isolation. But when you add the integration services over the top of this, things start changing very, very quickly. In terms of when a lead is one within your CRM system, it pushes it into your product management system and your task management system for people to do things. When that work is done, the time is being sent to a time tracking system where, they're then, where the time is then processed. You check for the profitability of the projects and the work that you're doing. The billable time is then pushed through to, to your accounting package where the invoicing is then happening. So the idea is not to look at these specific systems because <coughs> I can press a button and change the systems. You know, and the picture looks largely the same. And that is because it's not which systems you're using that is important. It is what does the overall picture achieve for you? you know, is 
are my quotes and proposals automated? That is my client take on smooth, you know, or do we keep forgetting to load a client onto a particular service to ensure that they, their VAT is done reliably? reliably? You know, those are the sort of finer details that through automation you can provide a level of service reliability and turnaround time that you wouldn't be able to achieve in the absence of integrating your systems. One thing important to note here is there is one component that tends to be missing from many uh, businesses at the moment and that's that second level of the business intelligence maturity that I showed in the earlier slide. And that is all these systems have got valuable information about how your business is doing. And the idea is, is that using these, these integration services, we can push the data through to a business intelligence dashboard where we can feed it information and it can compare information from multiple systems and provide you with business intelligence. So this is something that we are working towards. We call it currently our, our end game of systemization. Why systemize to this degree? And that is because you want the end game of being able to make better decisions. Not have to wait for the information when you need to make a decision on something. Okay, so the first one was the most complex one. The first response is integrate your systems and there's a lot of new technologies and a lot of new developments there. So looking at the second response, and that is to utilize automa automation. So now that your systems are integrated, now you can start automating between those systems because the integration gives you the predictability. <clears throat> so looking at the automation of your business processes, um, the planning of your technology investment, that's something that, uh, that we, we, we advocate as well, is look at your technology investment similar to what you would think about in terms of a human investment. I invest te in technology the same way I invest in a human being. I need to spend time with that person, I need to give that person a roadmap of how to develop skills that they need to and capabilities that they need to learn. And we advise thinking about your technology is the same way because we employ people so that they do work and ultimately be productive for us. The technology, you can follow the same pattern. So in terms of your planning and your, and your strategy, think about technology as people. And invest more capital in workforce augmentation rather than traditional workforce in, in investments is something that we'd also, also adv advocate. Give a preference to temporary contra contracts rather than permanent ones. This is more a general IT advice. Don't sign a five-year contract for any piece of technology. You can, we cannot predict how the, what the space is going to look like in five years, and you don't want to be contracted for that. Month to month, 12 months at most. That's what we, we would advise in, in most cases. Okay. And the other thing is, favor buying in services rather than trying to build the capacity in-house. You know, we, we find that in this newer, newer space, people need to specialize more. And depending on the size of your firm, it might be more cost effective for you to contract in a specialist service than it is to build that capacity in-house. Okay. Response number three is utilizing the business intelligence systems for informed decision making. So again, these responses are building on top of one another. Once we've integrated our systems, we can start extracting business intelligence information from that, both for yourself and for your clients. And then the third phase is we expect that we can utilize artificial analytics built into these business intelligence systems. But even though the products don't exist today, we do know that those products are going to rely on structured business intelligence information in order to do their job effectively. And that's, uh, that, that we know and we can plan for already. And then the important thing here is to program your key business drivers into your business intelligence tools. This is one of the frustrations that we find when a client asks us a business question to go into dive into the existing business systems to get the answer. The standardized reporting built into most systems are designed to report on the activities within that system only. It is sometimes difficult to put that information in the context of what is happening in the rest of the business. 
So that is something that, that, that you need to do, is when you're building your business intelligence dashboards, it's important to understand what your key business drivers are. And this comes back to your IT governance policy. IT governance policy says our systems need to be able to report on the following key business drivers. The business strategy is going to work out what systems need to do and what people need to be involved in order to feed that information for those key business drivers. So again, we're looking at that end-to-end -end approach from the top of the organization all the way down. So looking at some examples of business intelligence dashboards, the important thing here is the immediacy and the adjustability of these dashboards. We're saying a dash uh, because this information as you're seeing it right now is a report, it's not a dashboard. But if I have the ability to change things on it, show this information, the same information only for that one division, change a button, feeds the info, uh, adjusts the information, that point in time adjustability to your reporting is what we call a, a business intelligence dashboard. The screenshot you're seeing here is uh, Microsoft's Power BI, which is one product in, in, in this space. And it's got templates for tying into Xero and tying into QuickBooks Online with some pre-built reports and dashboards that you can already, already use. Another component, in the, another uh, leader in this space is uh, Google da Google's Data Studio, uh, which depending on which products you're using can also tie into that information. So again, which tool you use is going to depend on which other tools you're already using. So this sort of functionality is, seen, is currently being built by companies like Microsoft and like Google. They've got the massive investment and experience in building analytical tools because they used it on their own businesses first. And these are what would be considered the currently the leading providers. Response number four is make provision for a more powerful and tech-savvy customer. And the new patterns of consumer behavior, we spoke about this a little bit earlier. I, d I don't know many of my friends that would climb into a traditional taxi. They far much prefer to Uber. It's more <coughs> convenient. They have their regular driver that they trust. They can see the ratings. You know, all of those components is, going to, is the, new, uh, the new consumer. And they want something that is immediate, they want something that is transparent, and they want to interact on a variety of, de of devices. You know, meet them where they are at is the, the motto that they say about your clients. You need to meet them where they are at. Um, it's difficult to force them into what you want them to do. And use technology-enabled platforms, you know, online transactioning, online chats, FAQs, you know, have a self-engagement model where your customers can talk to you without consuming human time. A lot, of the, a lot of the newer generation of consumers actually prefer that. Okay. And obviously, the level of self-service for the menial basics should be, uh, should be standard and is mutually beneficial. Okay, response number five is addressing the increasing workforce skills gap. The systems that we are introducing requires a higher level of competency and skills. And this is something that we need to start making the investment early now uh, to make sure we don't end up in a situation where we've got a workforce skills gap for the people we have um, that use these systems and need to service clients. Emphasize self-education. Or before that, using learning management systems to automate the teaching. It's very expensive time for people to, um, to sit and train people. So create the training materials once. Right now, this screen is being recorded. That microphone is picking up my voice. Any questions people may ask. This recording I can have on YouTube an hour or two after the presentation. And that video can then be watched by anybody who's got access to that, that material. So similarly, having learning management systems and programs is going to be essential going forward. Because we're going to be employing people coming from an education system that is not prepared for this new revolution. And we're going to need to get them to catch up very quickly. Emphasizing self-education and not only company-provided training is also essential, not just for our workforces, but for all of us. 
The pace of change is going to require that we all make investments in ourselves in order to keep pace with these developments. And then, of course, using online training resources is also something that is important. If you're evaluating a particular system that uh, to be used in your business, evaluate how good the quality of their training resources are, because that is also important. It's no good if a system can do everything that you need, but nobody knows how to use it, and getting everybody trained on how to use it is too expensive. So make sure that your services that you acquire have got the online training material available. The other component here is looking at what is called just-in-time learning. When I need to do something, the resources that I need are teaching me how to do it is immediately available along with the instruction. So if you think about your business processes, your, your project templates and those sort of things, the best time to give somebody training is just before they're doing something. And only learning them to the degree that they need it and not more. Because at the moment our learning systems are designed around learn everything, maybe use it later, and forget most of it by the time you need it. <coughs> okay, so as a value add, uh, after this presentation, we've got a fourth industrial revolution readiness tool that are as available as a Google form, um, that you can ask yourself some of these questions around where your business is at at the moment, so that you can look at, oh, am I at the initial stage? Am I at a structured stage or am I at a mature stage in, in terms of that, uh, that level? Okay. So comments, questions and suggestions.